Uh, good afternoon or good morning and good evening wherever you are. It's lovely to be here. This is a webinar in a series that we've been running since April this year, which is talking about mental health all over the world. And we've had lots of different topics and speakers. And the idea is to share information about what's happening, what's new, um, what you can learn from different people and organizations in different countries and to share your ideas. This afternoon, we're going to talk about education and mental health. So the issue is how do those things, those issues intersect? What can we learn from each other in the education and, and health worlds? We're going to have an introduction to what, how, what the links are and then talk about how to address the mental health needs of children, teachers and carers, and also students in a tertiary education setting. And then we'll talk about the angle from the issue from different angles. So how can we use schools as an environment to improve mental health? What do we do for children who are out of school? Uh, what do we need for students? We've talked about a bit. And then how does the education system support good mental health and vice versa? We're hoping to have as our speakers, uh, four speakers, in fact, um, we've got two so far and another two are on their way. So we have here Anne Will Hoyt from UNICEF, who's a mental health expert um, working on particularly on the mental health and psychosocial support issues from an emergency point of view. And she has at least 10 years in the field working on those issues, and she can tell you more about that. And then we have Paul, who's a program specialist at Lego, and they have a new humanitarian portfolio. So he's working on the issues particularly around children as it relates to education and, and play and mental health and those links. We have Jeffrey Omega, who's from Basic Needs, Basic Rights in Kenya, and they work particularly with a tertiary education. That's what he'll talk about. And he has clinical research in bipolar and methadone assisted therapy. And then finally, we have Johnson Tike Hena, who's the director of school health at the Ministry of Education in Liberia. So he'll be able to talk about what's happening in Liberia and the links between health and education, which is fantastic. Both Jeffrey and Johnson are struggling a bit with the technology today, so we're going to get started and hope they can join as soon as possible. If you're interested in sharing your um, thoughts, you can do that through social media. So the hashtag is mh 4 all the webinar. And then also, of course, you can put your questions in the chat. Uh, we'll do a couple of rounds of questions and then I'd like to take questions from the audience. We've already got some. And then we'll summarize briefly with a statement from each of the speakers, which we'll post online and immediately afterwards in tweet form to summarize what we've been talking about. So those of you who know, the webinar is recorded and then the recording goes up online afterwards. So you'll be able to see that. There will also be notes of the session and we'll post those online within 24 hours. So I'm gonna start with Anne to help explain it to us all. Why is education so important uh, to, to supporting and improving a young person's mental health? Thanks, Sarah. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining today and for being so interested in this subject that is near and dear to our work. Um, so why is it so important to integrate MHPSS uh, and education? Why is education so important for a young person's mental health? So I think, first of all, it's helpful to think about the fact that for school age kids, they see their teachers as much or more than they do their parents and their families and their caregivers. So schools, in addition to teaching traditional learning subjects, are also the holders of socialization, support and encouragement for a child for most of their waking hours. Um, to support a child's mental health is as much a part uh, as a school's impact, whether they're prepared for that or not. So therefore, teachers and schools need to be and provide environments to safely support children, promote resilience, teach healthy emotional and relational development, and provide or refer to services when needed. Um, safe schools and non-formal learning spaces are some of the most beneficial environments for children and youth, especially during periods of uncertainty. Sarah mentioned that I focus primarily on emergencies. Um, and so during uncertainty, like emergencies or other things uh, happening in their families or around them, but also even just as a normal day-to-day -day constant. Uh, so intentional investment in education-based MHPSS, like through social emotional learning, for example, 
has proven to protect them from the negative effects of disasters and in, in the work that I do and creating more stable routines and structure, supporting some sense of normalcy and um, providing opportunities for play, fostering hope, reducing stress and encouraging self-expression. All of these things are factors that can support children's and youth uh, well-being and resilience. Thanks. And Another. Thanks. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. I want to ask, I guess there were two follow-up questions to that. One is, when you say social emotional learning, what does that mean for people who don't really know? And then everyone's very conscious about COVID and the impact that that's had on children and schools and families. And is there evidence from UNICEF's work about the impact and what that means? Or the, uh, what, what, what would you say to that? Yeah, good question. So social emotional learning um, is uh, very simply put a way to help uh, teachers and students understand the emotional aspects of the curriculum that they're already teaching and how they can be there and provide for students and schools can provide a supportive and emotional, emotionally supportive environment in addition to and integrated with traditional learning uh, modules, traditional learning techniques. Um, so it's essentially taking into account the emotional learning of the student in, in addition to the educational learning and supporting teachers in doing that, supporting students in understanding that, and often supporting caregivers also at home in supporting uh, their child through uh, emotional uh, learning aspects of their education. Um, in terms of COVID, uh, I think these things are especially uh, important. So we at UNICEF especially have been advocating for educational priorities that are COVID specific, especially as schools are reopening and reclosing and reopening all around the world. Um, and so things that we have really thought are important to touch on are advocating to national governments to ensure that teacher workforce is retained even when it's closed and that distance learning materials focus on children's mental health, social emotional learning, psychosocial well-being, um, establishing proper back to school plans and supporting the protection and well-being of kids, um, especially those who may not return uh, over time. Uh, we also, can I keep going, Sarah? This is really helpful, I think, for people. I, I noticed on your website, for example, you've got tips for parents about as children return to school, what they need to think about. I think there's some really practical challenges for lots of people, so it's useful to hear. So about the distance learning, back to school plans, protection for kids that may or may not return to school. Um, were there other exactly. aspects? Yeah, so we have several tips for caregivers on how to support their younger children and also teens um, during the pandemic, which you can find on our website. I think it's also really worth noting that caregivers serve such a vital role, uh, especially during COVID, and that's really been, uh, I think, highlighted on a global level and on a very personal level. I think any of us who are parents and have kids in school know just how much this is taking a toll on all of us. Uh, and so making sure that that is really included as a part of the educational plans also to support the caregivers uh, and also government plans. Um, caregiver effects of stress on their kids makes it even more of an uh, essential reason for us to support caregivers. Thanks, Anne. I think that's come out, certainly for those of you who attended the DevEx meeting last week that was at the same time that covered a bit of that with the Bernard Van Leer Foundation. And we've spoken in earlier webinars about the impact on children and caregivers. That's really important. And there's actually a whole webinar series coming up on caregivers and mental health, particularly focused Great. on Africa. So for those of you who are interested, we can include mention of that in, um, in the notes. Um, I'm going to turn to Paul. So Paul, you're going to talk about play and mental health, which I think when you and I were talking ahead of this session, you were saying not everyone understands why play is so important and how it also mm -hmm. is important, obviously, to education. Do you want to talk a bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Sarah. And Anne, thank you so much for setting that uh, foundation. Um, for us at the foundation, well, firstly, in emergencies, we know that education can be life-saving. It provides physical um, safety for children and psychosocial safety for children. Um, and schools become a really important system of care for children, um, as Anne just talked about. Um, <clears throat> for us at the LEGO Foundation, we are very much about 
understanding and, and promoting education systems that foster children's holistic skills. So for us, what we mean by holistic skills, we mean those are the creative, cognitive, social, emotional, physical skills um, that education systems are, are more and more starting to promote. Um, and in times of conflict and crisis, the social, these social emotional skills are really the pillars to help children succeed. Um, and in these types of contexts, education can really support children's coping mechanisms. They can build upon the resilience that children have developed during uh, emergencies. Um, and it can really help gain uh, holistic skills. So the social emotional is really like the foundation. Uh, why am I talking about these different skills? Well, for us, we believe that learning through play uh, is a perfect vehicle for holistic skills development, especially social emotional skills development. And when we say learning through play, we may mean things like free play or, or role plays or games, but we mean a lot more than just that. And we have five characteristics to what we mean by learning through play. And they are um, experiences for children in schools that are meaningful. Meaningful is the first um, characteristic. Uh, they, these are experiences that are engaging for children. Um, they're, they promote social interactivity, they're joyful, and they're iterative. And so these are the different types of learning through play activities really respond to these different characteristics, which we believe can really promote those social emotional skills. Thank you, Paul. And in terms of, I mean, it's really interesting what you're saying about the characteristics of play and whether um, when people are thinking about how they're supporting children, do they really reach all, all five? So that's really helpful to understand. And I think you have literature on that so that people can really understand and dig into it a bit more. Um, and I think you mentioned that you have a new online training course coming, is that right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later, but we do have um, a new report that's about to be released that really looks at the connections between learning through play and children's coping mechanisms. And we did a, um, a review of the evidence around play and coping strategies. And some of the findings that have come out of that report are, is that um, one, play really does help to support um, and help children cope with stress. Um, also, we're seeing that in education settings, learning through play activities can help develop really essential cognitive social emotional skills, such as impulse control, uh, emotion regulation, um, positive social relationships and positive social skills, developing empathy, um, and also cooperation skills. And so um, we, we also noted in that report, which we'll share with you all, is that teachers play a very pivotal role in supporting not only making sure environments are safe, but that also that um, relationships are positive in classrooms, but also promoting these different social emotional skills using learning through play methodologies. Um, and we're seeing that teachers, when they use learning through play uh, techniques in the classroom and they, they facilitate learning through play activities, that these activities help alle alleviate student stress and really do improve those relationships between teachers and students, but also between students and students. Thank you, that's helpful, Paul. And I guess, um, when you say play, what age group does that apply to? Could that be any age? I mean, can we all play or is it, is this really something for small children? Yeah, play is age ag agnostic. Yes. So okay. often you think about play for early childhood education or early childhood development. But really, we have to also developed like some play facilitation guidance around what does play look like for different age groups? And in the course, I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, I'll specifically mention the age groups that um, we've outlined in the course and how you have to adapt your play for different age groups. Great, that's good to hear. Thank you. Um, I'm going to see if Jeffrey is able to join. Jeffrey, are you able to join us? Give a minute for him. He was having some technical issues before. Okay, I'm going to assume not, and I want to go back to what Anne was talking about for a moment. Jeffrey, just to check, can you can we hear you? Okay, I'm going to go back to Anne.
Sarah, I've lost your sound. Oh, here we go. Can you hear me okay? There we go. So we were talking about, um, you and I were talking before about social emotional learning and the link between mental health and education. And I know that for this World Mental Health Day, UNICEF was calling for a revolution in child mental health. So do you want to talk a bit more broadly about child mental health for a moment? As you said, in the context of COVID, there's a lot more discussion about children's mental health. So what's UNICEF's approach on that? Um, yeah, I think I, when thinking about what UNICEF's doing and, and our approach on that, I actually thought it might be interesting to think through how we think about the relationship between education and MHPSS mental health at UNICEF. Um, is that okay? Yep, go ahead. Um, so we really think of it as a bi-directional relationship where educational settings, like I was talking about before, are ideal for supporting children's mental health and well-being, but also uh, reciprocally, including an MHPSS approach in education improves educational outcomes. So it's good for both MHPSS mental health outcomes and education outcomes to work together. And sometimes by not having those, it can really be a bottleneck to uh, achieving what, what kids are capable and require and uh, uh, need for both education and MHPSS. So a child who has their emotional and psychological needs cared for is better able to learn. Um, so the vision of UNICEF's uh, education strategy is that every child learns. Uh, and so more fully expressed, that means improved learning and and skills development for boys and girls from early childhood to adolescence, uh, and particularly for the most marginalized uh, and those affected by humanitarian situations. So those are the things that we focus on. Um, most recently, like you mentioned, one of the things that we're actually doing to make that come true is a lot of our advocacy messaging. Um, so for World Mental Health Day, we put out an advocacy briefing. Um, I have the link to that here. I don't know if I'm able to share it in a chat box or something, but Maybe you yeah. can send it out. Uh, and if not, we can certainly message it afterwards. Yeah, send it around. Okay, afterwards. great. So we have an advocacy briefing. We had a whole suite of Twitter and uh, uh, Instagram messages, which I can also share the link to. And then, as you mentioned, we put out a blog calling for a revolution in children's mental health. And for all the reasons that, that we're talking about here today, uh, it's really necessary, particularly following COVID, uh, to have a more specific and intentional approach to mental health. And that means that it needs to be integrated across all sectors. It's not the responsibility of just education. It's not the responsibility of just social welfare. Uh, it's not the responsibility of just health, but it is the responsibility of all of those different sectors. And so working together is essential. Uh, another thing that we're doing to that point is creating a minimum service package for mental health and psychosocial support. It'll be specific to emergencies, but it'll be relevant to everyone, uh, we hope. And so it'll be essentially a priority service package saying, okay, in, in the health sector, you need to do these actions. In the protection sector, you need to do these actions. And relevant to this conversation, uh, in the education section sector, you need to do these ac actions to adequately meet the needs of MHPSS uh, in education systems. So that'll be coming out uh, end of next year, and we'll be testing it in five different countries and um, look forward to all of the feedback that we get once it's published. Thanks, Anne. And I think that was one of the outcomes of the Mind the Mind um, co conference that took place last year, the ministerial meeting that the Dutch government hosted, and it's been a piece of work that UNICEF and the WHO have been working on for some time. So it's going to be super important as a way of helping guide what is the what should be delivered in emergencies. That's right, isn't it? And with UNHCR, so it's, yeah, it's UNICEF, WHO, and UNHCR together, funded by the Dutch and DFID, uh now FDCO. Great, thank you. Um, Jeffrey, I can see you've now dialed in a different way. Can I just see if you can now hear us or you can speak? Yes, yes, Hi. I can hear you guys. Great, okay. Can well, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, well, I'm really delighted to have you here. So, so far what we've done is talk about really around younger children um, and maybe even teenagers, but you're focusing more on tertiary education, I think. So did you want to talk a bit more about tertiary education and the link with mental health in your work? 
Yes, sure. Uh, first of all, apologies. Technology knows, uh, has its ways of disappointing us when you need it the most. So, yes, that having been said, yes, um, I'm, I'm, I'm working for an organization called Basic Needs, Basic Rights Kenya, where we uh, advocate on matters mental health, psychosocial disability, epilepsy. And uh, one of our projects that uh, involves the tertiary uh, sector of education is uh, mental health, provision of mental health services at uh, universities. I think uh, um, the, the background of uh, mental health, uh, the need or urgency of uh, focusing or improving uh, infrastructure and services that are geared towards uh, catering to the psychosocial needs of students is really high. And uh, uh, we've, we had this period where we had uh, um, huge uh, an upsurge of cases of suicide, depression, anxiety, substance use. So that's why with this program we are running in the, uh, in the public universities, we are trying to improve that uh, the accessibility to these psychosocial interventions. For example, uh, we are training the we are training the university staff to be able to uh, detect these cases at an early stage and be able to offer mental health first aid. Uh, we are training the students to be the, uh, the their brothers keepers, mental health ambassadors, as we call them, so that they're able to also uh, detect these cases at an early stage before um, um, they, they become, you know, uh, severe, severe disorders. Uh, we're also training the teaching, the, the teaching, teaching and unteaching staff, the security team, uh, the ones who man the hostels. We're training them to be able to really understand how uh, mental disorders usually uh, manifest themselves because uh, what we've been having is uh, misinterpretation and misunderstanding of uh, mental health issues. Uh, you'd find a student uh, portraying with the serious severe cases of addiction and instead of them getting the necessary interventions, they are rather expelled from school. You'll find students who are chased away, you'll find students who are punished. And uh, ideally what you're trying to do is just increase that level of awareness uh, with this program we're having in the universities. We're also having anti-stigma campaigns. Uh, we're also having um, establishment, establishment of peer support systems where we have uh, peers or the students form groups, uh, an ecosystem where they're able to discuss challenges that uh, uh, usually uh, they face when during the pursuit of the various university uh, degrees and and I think um, uh, in 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 most low and middle income uh, countries, um, psychosocial you'll find most students come from very low socioeconomic backgrounds. So that already is a predisposing factor that might might uh, let me say put them at risk to develop these other divine coping mechanisms to this need. You find uh, female students, for example, go to campus when they are uh, pursuing their degrees. They 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 indulge in some risky behavior so that they're able to meet their uh, financial needs in the university. So um, that's just one component. You find even the male students mm -hmm. who indulge in very deviant and harmful behavior so that they're able to meet their needs. So we empower these yeah. youth, we empower them to approach positive coping to these stressors. We also uh, give them some sense of livelihoods, how they can be able to meet these demands in a healthy way. Um, another key component, uh, very interesting, is using art to improve awareness or to, to improve, uh, to promote positive or uh, treatment-seeking behavior on matters mental health. Now with art, the students usually come together, have sessions, and uh, if, if, for example, they're discussing depression, they do it in a, in a so normal way, I mean, streaming it in a way that you'd find everyone is comfortable to talk about the challenges that they go through. So. Um, it, it has really been effective because you find now more students coming out and saying, uh, this is what I've been going through, uh, my, this, is the, um, this is how I wish to uh, spread the message to my fellow youth, how they can be able to address these challenges that ideally, uh, let me say we, it's become common that if you go to the university, there are stresses that you have to go through, but it's about how you handle them in a way that it doesn't put you at risk to uh, uh, let me say, dive into the further end of mental, uh, the, the end continuum of severe mental disorders, yeah. Yeah, thanks, I, I think but, that's yeah. really helpful because what you've also, you've done is touch on some of the same issues, but from a different perspective. So as you said, it's about, I guess what uh, the others have talked about in terms of social, emotional resilience in this case. So resilience for mm -hmm. students and then the people around them and how they support them, which is, as you said, is so important. 
And then a second thing that you talked about, which actually we haven't talked about so much yet, is a stigma and how you overcome stigma and misunderstanding around mental health, which actually can start with young children and their families way before they get to universities. So it'd be good to think about, uh, maybe go back to that. In terms of what you've seen recently around COVID or around the last few months, has that changed your work, Jeffrey, in terms of trying to reach out and, and work with students? Um, yes, of course. Um, with COVID, of course, uh, the universities were closed. That's the first thing. So everyone was sent away from the university. Uh, so ideally, um, it, it made it really hard for us to reach the students because one, uh, being that they come from low socioeconomic backgrounds, not everyone has the gadgets that they can use to access any online platform. So as much as we are trying to uh, migrate and, and embrace technology, uh, it's not really inclusive. So um, we try to, uh, let me say, um, device, we've devised mechanisms that are able to also reach out to the students. For example, um, we have talked of the Forum Theatre, Forum Theatre where they, they enact these cases, they enact conversations around mental health. We've taken it now on the Zoom platform, we've taken it uh, uh, where we hold these sessions, the students hold these sessions and then they share these networks to their fe uh, fellow students. Um, unfortunately for those who don't have um, the smartphones or laptops are not able to join in, but for the ones who are able to uh, join the join these sessions online, we facilitate them in the program. We issue them airtime because someone might have the phone, but then again, they don't have the internet bundles. So yeah. that's one way we're using to still reach to the students. Secondly, we've established virtual peer support systems. Uh, you you know the. Um, when the universities were ongoing, we had uh, support groups that were being run by the counselors and were being run by the peer, the trained mental health ambassadors. So what we're doing now is we are facilitating these students with airtime and the counselors to be able to hold these sessions on uh, through mobile phones. And uh, we've also set up a telecounseling platform. Uh, the telecounseling platform is where uh, we have toll free lines where the students can call the counselors at any time at no cost so that they're able to, uh, uh, let me say, meet these, uh, meet the uh, uh, the interventions that you really need. Because with COVID, what it has done, it is it has really made worse the situation for most of them, because uh, you'd find that for some of the students, uh, the parents have been laid off work and they're already uh, in situations that are really not that financially um, stable. So uh, they really need these interventions. And uh, to actually address that, we also have COVID relief uh, package where we usually support them so that they're able to meet their basic needs you know the meals you can't really uh, meet to a, uh, a psychological need of someone if you've not really addressed the uh, for example someone who has not eaten for weeks you can't really yeah. put that person through a therapy session you have to meet that immediate need first so it's more of about the embracing technology and making sure um, that it's inclusive even as we as as, as we are trying to really um, um embrace this new way this new way of 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 uh, of, of a norm so uh and we're also working with psychosocial uh dis physically disability uh physical disability students we're also working with uh, uh, persons living with disability rather um from the different groups we're trying to reach out to them um if it's uh, people who have hearing impairments we have sign interpreters who come and uh, help trans translate these messages so that everyone is included in these interventions because most of the times we'd find that you might really forget about this other kind of population who really might need this service during this period, especially during this pandemic. Thanks, Jeffrey. I think that's incredibly important. So what you're saying is it's now about technology and access to technology, but also about beyond technology. So how can you support people and including around basic needs? And that came out in several of the webinars that we where we've talked to different contacts throughout the world, particularly in India and other places where if you don't support basic needs. As you said, it's hard to support mental health. That's the Mariwala Foundation, others have said that. And then to the point about disability, I think that's something, and maybe you're going to talk a little bit more about, but about how do you include children who are outside of systems or are excluded because of disability or misunderstanding from families? Um, I think the inclusion point is really important. It was part of this march for mental health that we helped run last week. There was a whole hour on, on inclusion. So it might be good to come to that. I wanted to come back then to the panelists. So thank you, Jeffrey, for what you were saying. Um, 
Anne, did you want to add more about at this point about what UNICEF is doing, a bit more about out of school populations? And then I was going to turn to Paul and his um, the course that he's developed. Unmute. OK, um, thanks. So, yes, I think that while we're talking about uh, education systems, we can't ignore the most vulnerable children who are often not in those systems. Um, and so everything we're talking about is especially true for the most vulnerable children among us, uh, in particular children who have potentially experienced violence. Um, and the, re the reason is very rooted in brain science, which we haven't really touched on yet today, but is really relevant for education uh, systems and settings. Um, so the consequences of violence and extremely adverse events experienced as a child can significantly impact a child's emotional and physical health um, and hamper the development of a child's brain. So when the nervous system is overstressed to a very high level, it disrupts the development of the brain and can have lifelong effects on behavior and health. So this makes it much more important for us to be paying attention to children who may have that experience in the system, but also out of, uh, out of this learning environment. So I'm really glad that Jeffrey touched on the systemic inequalities. I think it's uh, vital for us to be thinking, if we're talking about mental health, uh, we can't ignore the systemic inequalities that are very true for our children. Uh, he mentioned the technology, and I think that's uh, going to be something we'll really need to be paying attention to after COVID in terms of how that's affecting uh, people's learning and access, uh, but also the other basic needs, too, that, that he mentioned, and I think to continue to think about in terms of uh, basic levels of uh, food and health care and uh, shelter and uh, love. Um, Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll end there and come, no, I'll come back to something else later. <laughs> so as you were saying, the basic needs, but then for out of school children and those at risk of violence, it's actually a whole, it has a generational impact. So this campaign that I've mentioned around Save Our Future, which is a UNICEF, UNESCO, World Bank, BRAC campaign is about a future generation. And I think UNICEF sees some of that language as well about the impact on a generation of being out of school, of um, maybe not having access, as you said, to the same basic needs that they have. And then the impact on the brain and brain science. There were some really powerful photos of that last week in the Ep webinar, DevEx webinar, that were shown by the Bernard Ballet Foundation. And it's, it's extraordinary to see the difference in brains and brain development. It's, it's very vis visually, you can see it. Um, uh, Paul, you were going to talk a bit more about the course, and, and this is something that's accessible for people who are interested in this issue. Yeah, um, maybe before I do that, just I'd like to just add a little bit to what Anne was saying. Um, the, the foundation itself, in the, since 2018, started a new funding portfolio um, that looked specifically at refugee and displaced children ages 0 to 12 to, to provide those children with early learning opportunities, which we know based on evidence, evidence is really important for their brain development and their social emotional development. Um, <clears throat> and then in 2019, we made another significant contribution to support um, protracted crises in East Africa to support children three to 12, refugee children three to 12 with social emotional learning through play opportunities. And so we're in the process of, of supporting different organizations to roll out programs that look at the connection between learning through play, children's coping, the impacts of toxic stress on children's uh, well-being and holistic outcomes, and how play-based opportunities can mitigate against the toxic stress that Anne was just talking about. Uh, so there will be programs and materials and tools and evidence that we're going to be generating that can really support the mental health and psychosocial field uh, moving forward on how education can continue to, to make that uh, that link, that bi-directional link that Anne was just talking about. Um, <clears throat> so sorry to do that little plug, Sarah, but I no, thought that would be fine. helpful that, that we are also very, very committed to um, learning more about how to support children's mental health, specifically the most vulnerable. And um, so Paul, before, just to, so on that, there are those materials or those resources, some of them are already on your website or more are coming or 
just for people who are more interested. More coming, but we we have posted some stuff. We have a we have the, our playlist, which is uh, which are social emotional based um, play activities that caregivers and teachers can use. So on the website itself, we have those things now. And then we've been working with IMEE to post other um, resources. So um, one of our grants, it's just the Play Matters Grant East Africa. We have all of the Play Matters at Home materials, which support children's well-being in, in a variety of different ways. And those are materials that caregivers can use with children, but also uh, materials that teachers can use to support um, children social emotionally um, via distance. So. Um, I can also find those materials um, for you on the IMEE website. We'll put them in there, no. That sounds brilliant. Thank yeah. you. Sorry, I interrupted you, and you were going to talk about your course as well. Yeah. So in the in COVID nineteen, we we had emergency grants that the board uh, approved for us to support children's um, psychosocial support. Um, and one of the things that we did is that we collaborated with a range of different experts on mental health, psychosocial support, and social emotional learning to design a free uh, online, um, massive online course that um, will, it kicks off next Monday on October 19th. Um, and basically the premise for this course was that we knew that, um, and Anne uh, was also talking about this, and Jeffrey was also talking about that this children around the world, they're adjusting to different impactful situations right now, which whether that be school closures, social distancing, schools reopening, and those schools are looking differently. Um, the probability and the reality of schools closing again and reopening, those uncertain transitions, we, we felt that learning through play could also play a role in supporting um, those transitions for, for children. Um, so this course really focuses on holistic skills for children, um, but with the promotion of mental health and psychosocial well-being at the front. Um, mm -hmm. It's grounded in the principles of social emotional well-being, which Anne also talked about around social, cognitive, emotional skills, but also looking at values and attitudes and identities. Um, and the course is really for adults who are uh, interacting regularly with children. So it could be teachers, caregivers, or aunts and uncles or other or social workers. So it's really it casts a wide net around who the 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 target audiences for the course. Um, but the intention of the course is to be playful, have, have participants experience learning through play as they go through their learning journey in the course. And the course will really look at the importance of mental health and psychosocial support. So we worked with the MHPSS Collaborative to, to develop those modules on why is the MHPSS so important and how what does play have to do with it? And then we also focused on, with the MHPSS Collaborative, we focused on caring for the caregiver, adult well-being, knowing that that is so important. Um, I think Leslie and, and Ashley from the MHPSS Collaborative talked about it as, you know, the oxygen mask. You have to put your own oxygen mask on first before you support, uh, you can put that mask on other, other people, including children. So there's a whole session and with tips and strategies on how you support your own mental health and psychosocial support. And then we worked with the Pedal Institute, the Pedal Center on what, how do you support learning through play, mental health in early childhood? And then the Harvard Ecological Approach to Social Emotional Lab helped us come up with modules and activities on how do you support school-aged children's uh, mental health with learning through play. And then we worked with Notre Dame's um, Global Center um, for the development of the whole child that looks at what do, how do you do learning through play for teenagers? What does that look like and how can that support their mental health and psychosocial support? Um, all of this is grounded on evidence and, and looking at neuroscience and what how really what does what what are those stages of development look like inside our brains and how we can support that development. That sounds really exciting. Thank you, Paul. So that's really available to anyone and everyone here. Um, today and we can promote that and I know on social media the Lego Foundation has been promoting it we've already been doing a bit of that as well um, and the right. same with UNICEF's materials so there's quite a lot of knowledge out there and, and materials available to people which is great um, I want to very briefly I've got a bit overexcited so we in theory we end in about five minutes but I did want to have time to ask at least one of the questions that came in from the audience which I think is relevant 
everybody, which is around um, the theme of World Mental Health Day this year. So the theme was access and also investment. Um, what's happening in terms of investment in this area of work? It's very important, but um, the foundation, you've talked a little bit, Paul, about how Lego is investing, which is great. Um, it'd be interesting to hear, Jeffrey, about um, is the Kenyan government investing? I know during World Mental Health Day, they've talked a lot about investment in mental health. Is there money going into this? Um, could there be more? And then I guess, um, Anne, from your perspective, what is UNICEF calling for by way of investment? Um, I don't want to put Paul on the spot about his future investments. It feels like Lego is doing a lot, but he may want to briefly say what else they may be doing. Jeffrey, do you want to answer that first about investment? Are you seeing support really for what you're calling for and what you're doing? Yes. Uh... Let me say we are on the right uh, right path as of now because uh, what COVID has done is uh, exposed to the gap, the level of neglect that has been accorded to the field of mental health. And um, I feel like um, the way the government is talking about mental health is not the same way it was uh, the previous years, even last year. So in terms of investment, um, there are plans. We had a, a mental health task force that was uh, called by the president to sort of try and address the mental health gap that exists in the country and how it can, uh, it, it may, uh, what are the solutions that may be used to actually address matters mental health as we re respond to the pandemic. And uh, yes, so there has been committees established and the likes, and I think uh, for us uh, in this specific program, uh, we trying we are trying to develop a policy brief, uh, evidence based uh, from the interventions we have. We are, we are establishing safe spaces in the program. We, we are establishing capacity building awareness. So it's from this policy brief that we aim to now table to the commissioner for university education in the country and have them incorporate these recommendations based on findings, solid findings of how mental health is a key and integral part in the academic sector because ideally um, it, it, it makes, uh, it's really, uh, let me say, um, um, it, it, it's, uh, it's not right to uh, set up this uh, uh, or, or assume that just because students are going to the university uh, and, and they can be able to achieve all uh, whatever challenges that they may face, academic, uh, social, psychosocial, and you don't provide the necessary avenues for them to meet some of their psychosocial needs. Because uh, like we like we say, all mental health advocates, there's no health without mental health. So that's basically the message behind um, us pushing the government to really invest more uh, in, in mental health. As of now, we're in the right direction. We, we right. do hope that uh, with the COVID innovations, we, it will get better, yeah. Great. Oh, that's really positive news from Kenya. And for those of you who haven't seen, just as Jeffrey mentioned, the government of Kenya put out quite strong statements around World Mental Health Day about what its plans are, its investment plans, and quite a number of um, the members of the Global Mental Health Action Network, of which um, Jeffrey is actually an Africa representative, um, have been involved in different ways in work in Kenya. And there's also a, a group, actually a financing working group, that's working on getting more investment into mental health in lots of different ways. Um, Anne, did you want to talk a bit about what UNICEF is calling for, what you want to see, and maybe even to mention the Child and Youth Working Group um, for the Global Mental Health Action Network, which you're involved in? Yeah. Great. Um, so overall, UNICEF's main advocacy message specific to education is uh, for increased investment for schools and communities to ensure all children learn in a safe, secure environment, soothing, supportive connections to teachers, uh, and the MHPSS services are available for everyone, uh, every child who needs it. So that's our overall statement that we, we put out in terms of our advocacy message for education specifically. Um, internally, UNICEF has also recently been really ramping up in terms of internal investments in MHPSS. Uh, and I am happy to say that ho hopefully many of you have seen there was a call out recently, there will be specifically a hire for MHPSS and education uh, in UNICEF, which is great. Um, there has been a specific set aside funding to ramp up MHPSS services integrated across all of UNICEF. So we're really looking forward to getting that going uh, and really seeing impact on the ground. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, uh, we also are really involved in 
uh, the Global Mental Health Action Network. Uh, I serve on the board and I'm also co-chair for our youth and uh, child working group globally and everyone is welcome to join. You can find it on uh, the Global Mental Health Action Network webpage, I believe. Um, and our main, main goals for that group are to increase uh, advocacy for children and youth in major global health events, as well as elevating uh, events that are happening at a regional level for child and youth mental health. Um, and then also to create guidelines for youth engagement and child engagement. Uh, it is necessary, especially as we're talking about education and all mental health services for children and youth, that children and youth be involved themselves from the very beginning on creating and establishing those services. Um, and so there hasn't really been guidance yet on, on best practice for that. There's lots of different organizational guidance, but there's not global guidance on how to do that. Uh, and so the, a lot of youth has, have been calling for more formal established guidelines on that because there have been such, there's been such a taxing uh, of them. And so we wanna do it well. So we'll be distributing that uh, as well broadly. Thank you, Anne. And yeah, that's a subject dear to my heart is I think there's a huge pressure now and with the interest growing on mental health for people to be asked for their experience and their learning, and particularly for people with lived experience. And I know personally how draining that can be to talk about one's own lived experience and to share that. So it's really important to kind of help support people through that and support people in, in taking part in consultations and and so forth. I'm going to, we're going to need to wrap up. So I'm going to ask each of you to have a think for a minute and then just summarize in one or two sentences what you think your top priorities for action should be on education and mental health, what you'd like to see happen, um, or what you're doing um, either way. Um, Paul, as I've given you a little bit of a rest in speaking, do you want to try first? What do you think are key priorities or what's the thing that you're, you're really passionately working on? Well, with COVID-19, with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the call for action that we have at the LEGO Foundation is to continue supporting holistic skills development for children uh, within education systems. Um, and that um, with a specific focus on social emotional skills. Um, and we really don't, we, we, we don't wanna see the fall back to traditional edu uh, academic skills. Um, when schools start to reopen uh, and we see um, school going back to quote unquote normal. Okay, so effectively, um, this is an opportunity for some, something of a revolution, as UNICEF have said, but in that in that particular concept in terms of skills and social emotional skills moving forward, that's brilliant. Um, Jeffrey, have you got in a sentence or two what what you think is important moving forward or what you're going to be working on? Yeah, sure. Um, currently, um, for this year, uh, um, for last year, our uh, online campaign was uh, hashtag not okay is okay. Uh, just fighting stigma that it's okay to feel the way you're feeling, um, and there are interventions that can bring you back to well to wellness. This year, our hashtag is mental wellness. Mental wellness basically meaning your personal attributions that uh, reinforce or ensures your psychological, emotional, um, and physical well-being. So with that, having uh, having said that, it's in line with the theme for World Mental Health Day, which is invest in mental health, and investing in mental health begins with you. So that's basically our campaign this period to try and tell everyone that if we are to invest in mental health, first it begins with investing in yourself. That's just my parting shot. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. I think that's something we should all be supporting, investing in mental health begins with you. Thank you. Um, Anne? Thanks. Um, I, I've, I've talked a lot already on some of our major asks and focuses, so I think I'll keep it simple and just note that in a sentence, our overall thought, uh, especially on education and MHPSS, would be calling for increased investment uh, and creating multi-layered multi-sectoral systems with education effectively linked to lots of other sectors, education, health, uh, livelihoods. Uh, doing that can effectively strengthen resilience, reduce developmental and societal risk factors for children, adolescents, and caregivers. Wow, oh, I'm glad we're not tweeting that, but th that sounds great. And for you more can. information, we will give the link so you can find the short version, but that's really helpful. And I, I think as you said, it's so important that mental health is more than 
health. And I think that's behind what, what UNICEF has been saying very clearly and has come forward today, as, I mean, it's come out today in the conversation. Thank you. I'm going to close by reminding people that this session has been recorded, that we'll put up a summary of the notes within about 24 hours and the recording itself. Um, next week, or two weeks, sorry, in two weeks, the session will be around the media and mental health. So reporting in the media, um, how to best use media and media engagement to improve mental health. We have a really interesting range of speakers on that. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a campaign called Save Our Future, which is specifically around education and COVID and what's happening. And they will have a white paper coming out quite soon. Um, and I will put the links and information that have been provided by each of the speakers in our notes so that others can see them. So I wanted to thank you all so much for being here. I'm sorry our colleague couldn't join us from the government of Liberia, but we'll try and get a brief statement from him to add to the notes as well. Thank you all so much. It's great to see you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.